Um, Hungarian film critics have rightly called the winners of 2006 Hungarian Film Week, Pafis Taxidermia, uh, Szabolcs Hajdu's White Poem, uh, and Korea Mundrucos Johanna, uh, Johanna, Tales of the Body, pointing out the excessive use of the body as motive and metaphor in these films. I argue that this is true for most Hungarian films made in the last decade, all being obsessed less with the sensual body that triggers an embodied spectatorship than with the aesthetic, figurative potential of its image, a body that makes sense, uh, i.e. A, a meaning. This can be primarily detected in the mission of representation of the more so-called social proximity senses of touch and smell in these films in favor of the gaze that keeps the social and individual body at distance. The characters are often the untouchables or the outcasts of the society. Dra uh, Romans, drug addicts, clones, prostitutes, lonely wolves, and the smell, if represented, is repulsive and triggers the alienation between the characters. Similarly, the image and color appears often in a film as a screen meant to hide or at least counterbalance odor. In uh, Agnes uh, Kochis' Fresh Air, we see the mother decorating her wall place, the public toilet, covering the walls all over with red fabric, a symbol of her attractive femininity. Her daughter finds tons of air fresheners uh, uh, of most varied brands in a cupboard. This is what Laura Morris calls the branding of olfactory associations, here meant to signify ironically the striking discrepancy between the commodities of Western globalization and the local smells that do, that I quote, do not respect walls or national borders, they drift and diffuse and inhabit, end of quote from uh, Laura Marx. This tendency to keep the body under visual control and observation finds its paradigmatic representation, I argue, in the clinical gaze symptomatic of the oculocentric, ocularocentric representation of the body that prevails in the art house register in the cinema, as thematized in two films, Johanna uh, by Kore Mundruzzo and Adrian Pal by Agnes Kocsis. Um, George Palfi in uh, Taxidermia provides us with three paradigmatic moments of the cinematic practice of bodily representations that he conceives as a li uh, linear process. Its, its first two parts correspond, uh, as uh, uh, Stephen Shavir also argues, to the category described by Linda Williams as a body genre that forces us to feel. <coughs> The first story, that of Moros Govani, evokes the masculine body genre of pornographic films, presenting an intensely sexual, sensual, even sensational body capable, capable to produce an orgasm as a firework. The second part is closest to what Shavio calls body horror, showing excessive, repulsive bodily practices, speed eating and vomiting under uh, external political threat and control. Shaviro identifies in the third part, the story of Lajos, the taxidermist, a perfect illustration of the concept of the bachelor, bachelor machine described by Deleuze and Gattari that transposes the eroticism of the body onto a machine. I quote, a genuine consummation is achieved by the new machine, a pleasure that can rightly be called autoerotic or rather automatic, the nuptial, the nuptial celebration of a new alliance, a new birth, a radiant uh, ecstasy, as though the eroticism of the machine liberated other unlimited forces, end of quote. But lawyer's self-taxidermizing act is also the sublimation of the previously presented bodily practices the stuffing and eviscerating into a work of art, a par excellence fetish, and commodity of the capitalist era. Not surprisingly, the film ends with the camera entering the void of Lyre's artwork body in a striking image illustrat uh, illustrating the notion of body without organs 
of Deleuze and Gattari, Borrow borrowed from Artaud, and this is a quote from Artaud, the body is the body, it stands alone, it has no need of organs, the body is never an organism, organisms are the enemies of bodies, uh, end of quote. In Amish Kochi's two films, Fresh Air and Andre and Pal, colors of clothes and environment become the only expressive figurative surface of bodies and relationships. As a counterpart of Parfis' play on, on male body genre, genres, the, the pornographic film and the horror, both film, films represent what Linda Williams lists on the feminine side of the body genre, uh, the maternal melodrama and the woman, woman's film showing women in crisis in their traditional role under patriarchy. But all emotions and gross bodily reactions and sensations have been extracted from these films as if in another figuration of the body without organs. Only the surface remained the colorful or colorless uh, skin of the film uh, accessible to the eyes but without a chance of spectatorial embodiment through other senses. In fresh air, red and green represent mother and daughter respectively, and as complementary colors they symbolize this ambivalent relationship. In Adrian Pa, the white robe of the nurse makes her body dissolve in the white environment of her workplace, uh, a hospital. Even though we see her eating or sitting uh, on the toilet, her body remains the same non-penetrable white surface all over the film just to become the gain, to gain new shape at the end of her self-discovering journey when she starts re-entering the hospital as a private person wearing light-colored clothes. The overwhelming mannerism of Cornel Mundruzos Johanna, the other clinic film, hospital film, is introduced with a self-reflexive gesture right at the beginning of the film in a play between reality and its cinematic illusion. The emergency, the emergency scene at the hospital turns out to be stage, uh, staged and the presumed victims of an accident walk away as extras. Only Johanna, Johanna the young uh, drug addict girl, remains trapped in the nightmarish setting of the hospital, showing signs of decay everywhere, enveloped in green light and uh, that makes bodies look cadaveric. But beyond the slave or captivity narrative, she is retained at the hospital as a nurse and closely observed by a doctor who falls in love with her. The film displays also what Gwendolyn Foster calls the taxonomy of capture of captive bodies in cinema that beyond spectatorial individual pleasure draws itself as a power knowledge, knowledge grid around the whole cinematic dispositive, history of filmmaking, spectatorship, production, distribution, and so on. The body uh, of the uh, uh, protagonist is repeatedly captured by medical machines, painterly compositions, reminding of Vermeer's paintings, X-ray images uh, and references to the myth of Saint John. Uh, so these uh, um, uh, allusions are, uh, in fact, one of the few which uh, refer the film to this myth. Uh, just to be disposed, uh, uh, she is disposed uh, uh, of in a plastic bag and, uh, uh, and sent to the wasteland at the end of the film. Moreover, the body of Orshi Toth, the emblematic actress on Bundruzzo's films, is captured over and over in the same image of a, fri a fragile child woman that becomes victim of a patriarchal society, a fetishistic image that she preserves even in her uh, non-Hungarian films. As Foster argues, the X-ray, te a technology that appeared in the same year with cinema, aims to capture the inside of the body. In fact, early cinema shares a scientific pre preoccupation with measuring and capturing, thus appears, according to Linda Williams, as just another implantation of perversions over the body. In her analysis of the theater of shadows of Moybridge, she argues that in a fetishistic pleasure, the viewer is entranced with the ability of machines to capture bodies. 
Thus, the theater of shadows is playing the healing sex scene uh, in, Yo in Johanna uh, addresses a fetishistic viewer captured not only by the image of bodies, but by the whole cinematic dispositive. So this, this nurse is, uh, decides to heal uh, the patients with sex. Uh, as Christian Matz has formulated, the cinema fetishist is the person who is enchanted by what the machine is capable of at the theater of shadows as such. For the establishment of his full potency for cinematic enjoyment, jouissance, he must think at every moment and above all simultaneously of the force of presence the film has and of the absence on which this force is constructed. His pleasure lodges in the gap between the two, in the code. So Johanna is a palimpsest of discourses on cinematic entertainment and spectatorship of a scientific cinematic inquiry on the body and the Foucaultian and also Foucaultian concept and Foucaultian concepts of regulation and control. Uh, this is already the domain of the figure that, according to Rodovic, uh, emerges in intermediate shifts, in this case between uh, the film uh, images and technological images. In a version of the Pygmalion complex, the young, the young doctor remodels the body of the girl through a clinical gaze. Technical images, X-ray, MRI uh, imaging, and uh, constant of observation, uh, often from the point of view of a machine. This is an MRI machine. In an evaluation of the X-ray images of Johanna's body in front of the medical committee, he calls Johanna a miracle and uh, argues against her release from the hospital. The artificially multiplied technique of the observing gaze, as Foucault puts it, I quote, uh, refrains from uh, intervening Oh, this not mad. It is silent, I quote, uh, it is silent and gestureless. Observation leaves things as they are. There is nothing hidden to it in what is given, end of quote. This distant controlling gaze is subverted in Johanna's healing technique with touch that triggers the accusation of witchcraft and ultimately her execution. In this allegorical story opposing healing with clinical observation and verbalization of symptoms, Touch, traditionally considered a primitive, more primitive sense, is discredited by vision. As Laura Marx points out, healing, uh, I quote, healing does imply a closeness to the body, while vision is the sense that permits the greatest distance between the body and the object. End of quote. Foucault, at the end of his archaeology of the clinical gaze, in the section about pathology that finally implies touch, emphasizes it, it, its attraction to death. To know life, I quote, to know life is given only to that derisory, reductive, and already infernal knowledge that only wishes it, it dead. The gaze that envelops, caresses, details, atomizes the most individual flesh and enumerates its secret bites it is that fixed, attentive, rather dilated gaze which from the height of death has already condemned life." End of quote. The morbidity of this gaze finds its expression in the representation of dead or terminally ill bodies in both Johanna and Adrian Paar, Agnes Koch's film. But films display, both films display a figurative representation of death in compositions reminding of Horbein's um, uh, the Body of the Dread Christ, the tomb, and Andrea Mantegna's The Lamentation over the Dead Christ, as mentioned already by, uh, analyzed by Agnes Petu. These intermedial images are also the figuration of the unspeakable post-communist lost uh, grief and melancholia. I argued elsewhere about this more detail. Uh, in Foucault's words, the morbid authorizes a subtle a perception of the way in which life finds in that its most differentiated figure. That left its old tragic heaven and became the very core of man, his invisible truth, his visible secret." End of quote. 
In its reading the Figaro, David uh, Rodovic relies on Deleuze's reading of Foucault that emphasizes the role of places of discursive activity and actions on the body in the definition of the subject. One of these places thoroughly described by Foucault is the clinic. According to him, uh, its spectacular organization constitutes a language of modalities of, of observation where the disposition of bodies and machines reflects power relationships of society. Koch's film, Adrian Paar, displays one of the most striking technologies of the visible that reveals actual institutional structures uh, through an organization of bodies in space and time. The role of monitors surveying the bodily functions of the patients. This is actually a version of the panopticon described by Foucault as the diagram. Uh, I call the diagram of a mechanism of power reduced to its idea of form. Its functioning, abstracted from an obstacle, resistant or friction, must be represented as a pure architectural and optical system. It is in fact a figure of political technology that may and must be detached from any specific use. Uh, beyond being a map of power relations based on the principle of seeing without being seen, this diagram also stands for the alienation of bodies through visual technology by reducing them to abstract formulas. The scenes set in the room with the wall of monitors alternate with those of washing, feeding, undressing, resuscitating, powerless or dead, equally depersonalized bodies. When a name emerges attached to a body that happens to be the name of a childhood friend of the protagonist, she decides to find herself outside the clinic while apparently looking for her long lost uh, friend. In one of the film's most emblematic scenes, we see her supervising a multitude of bodies on the wall of monitors while she loses control over her own body. She's engorging creamy cakes. I don't know if it's... Uh, um, visible over there. Besides condensing the basic mechanism of melancholia, caring too much for others triggers the loss of the self, this image is just another figuration of the absent body alienated through gaze. The scenes of compulsive eating also recall the excessive eating and self-stuffing images from taxidermia although be without the body horror of this later. At the beginning of the film, Nurse Piroshka is just another empty body that figurates the identity crisis and disorientation that followed the fall of communism. The message of Koch's film is, however, optimistic. It is possible to fill the void by remembering, accepting, and ultimately reconciliating the communist old, forgotten, sick, dying, dead, smelly, deformed body with the post-communist absent body alienated through gaze. Uh, and to conclude, uh, the themes that I choose uh, for analysis share the conviction, conviction that beyond modernist paradigms so easily worn out by popular genre, genres, there is another way to appropriate human consciousness and subjectivity through extensive figuration and intrusion of myths and legends, in this case the legend of St. John, into the representation of everyday life. As we have seen, the central figure of this formalism is the body, not the sensual body of the popular body genres, but a body without organs, an absent or empty body, an untouchable body. This body becomes a surface, a screen onto which ver varied cultural discourses, post-colonialism, transnationality, racism, feminism, capitalism, and commodity, just to name a few, can be easily projected. Thus, it is only accessible to the most distant uh, intellect and intellectual of all senses, intellectual and <laughs> uh, uh, metaphorically. Vision, in its paradigmatic version, the clinical gaze, as thematized in Mundruzzo's and Koch's films. But uh, the often intermediate image of the alienated body is not simply the product of some aesthetic dandyism. It also bears the implied message that, due to the traces left by the collision of old and new times, the social body is still too damaged and problematic to be shown.
Despite their aestheticism and an apparent lack of social sensitivity, these films are still political in the sense proposed by Jacques Rancière. They reconfigure appearances, reframe problems, and redefine what can be seen and said. Thank you very much. The Dustin Watari distinguished between different kinds of bodies without organs. Uh, of course, there's the, the full body, the empty body without organs, and so on. The less. The less. Okay. The Watari, well, in, in anti organ disorder, and uh, to me, all like automatically, because I read it into their like overall, over, uh, I always think of the body without organs as the, the sort of potential for liberation, for reorganization, for. Uh, whereas, but maybe I misinterpreted your presentation, but I see that you have focused more on the, the, the sort of, uh, I don't know how to put it, but, but not, the sort of, not, the, not the potential for resistance, for liberation, for mm -hmm. connecting it to the panoptic, you're connecting it to, you, you said towards the end that the body without the organ, the organs is the surface upon which one can project, uh, so, which is absolutely yeah. true, I think, in relation. But if you're sort of focusing on, on another aspect, so have you thought of, of this out, like, have you thought on the, the possibility of resistance, the possibility of liberation, the possibility, is that uh, something that interests you or more sort of oppressive power? Uh, uh, yes, I, I think the body with, without organs is, is a very, it's a, it has many many interpretations, and uh, and yes, it was completely compared to an egg, which bears the potential for liberation. Yes, but uh, I I, uh, I agree with Laura Mars who compares uh, uh, the body without, without organs with a um, water balloon, I think, on which you can uh, imprint uh, traces, and which and then uh, again. Uh, um, um, and then those traces remain there, but the the shape comes back to the old form, and again you can you can you can imprint uh, um, or uh, shape new forms in it. So uh, I that's this I, I was yeah, I was considering this uh, metaphor as as a surface, the body without as a surface which uh, on which uh, uh, we can project uh, uh, interpretation. So a purely visual surface on which ideologies, discourses, the figure is projected. And yes, because I think I, I, uh, I um, at the end I, uh, I uh, talked about it uh, shortly, that yeah, it's optimistic, the, um, this uh, interpretation of the body uh, as appears in, in these films, in that uh, uh, there is there is uh, a chance, there is hope to refill this empty post-communist alienated, bod alienated body with this uh, accepted old body. So there is um, there is uh, uh, a tendency of approaching and accepting this body, which is over and over represented as untouchable, stinking, problematic. Uh, um, obese or whatever. Can, can I add just a little bit of time? If, if, uh, do you think that does, does the body without organs remain a body without organs once the, the, the ideology or whatever is, is projected onto it? Because I understand the body without organs as this point where there is no organization. It's not an empty, uh, it doesn't have to be empty. No, but it's. That it is not organized. I yeah, I, I, I uh, conceive it as an aesthetic mm -hmm. body, so as, as something to look at and uh, uh, a body that makes meaning, not uh, sensation, not provokes sensation. We can talk about it later. between the bodies in Relatar and the bodies you were speaking about here from the younger generation who are 
this younger generation are in a way remembering you know, socialist times and, and advocating things from, as you mentioned, you know, refill the body with, with something mm -hmm. which remained from, from older times. And uh, the body obviously is a very important surface or object for Vera as well, but these films are obviously quite different from these films. So what do you think about the use of the... I think uh, the new generation is uh, in a certain um, manner under the influence of uh, Belatar, and I think that Belatar was heading towards this uh, over aesthetization of the body. Uh, as uh, uh, Agnes Petu has shown, the, the, the quite open references to the Mantegna and Holbein uh, paintings, and there are other uh, references to, to uh, photographs, uh, Cartier-Bresson in, uh, in the, um, the man from London. Uh, so I choose these two particular films because I, I consider them quite uh, a radical approach, uh, a radical example of, uh, of this uh, over aesthetization of the body. Uh, but I think uh, uh, um, Belatar is uh, always preoccupied with uh, universal human um, uh, misery. So it, that is there. Here it's too, too aestheticized. It's already too self-reflexive. Uh, uh, um, uh, and and uh, of course, Vilatar has that atmospheric music there, which uh, attaches the senses directly. So I, I think Bellator was headed was heading with this extreme long shot towards towards painterly compositions, <laughs> but he stopped before getting there. So, but you. Yes, I was just uh, wondering since you both mentioned uh, taxidermia and you also mentioned body horror as a genre, uh, in what way you looked at um, horror genre tropes? To compare to all this work, because the, the shot of the, um, the man being stuffed is almost exactly the same as um, the most recent addition to the House of Wax venture, in which someone is being turned into a, a wax statue. And a lot of it almost literally relates back to that whole trope of um, wax museum films, which also very uh, openly uh, advocate the Pygmalion trope and the uh, wax artist. And, Sort of and I wonder if you, if you've thought about that at all in relation to this. The body horror. Yes. In, in other films. Museum films or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where, where bodies are mummified in the mm -hmm. uh, But I think, uh, as uh, Agi already mentioned, there is a duplicity in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, um, in Palfi, the body horror and this extreme aestheticization, which is which creates this paradoxical um, um, image of the body, uh, uh, which appears in, in his films. Uh, and in Taxidermia, this body horror is, is always distantiated uh, aesthetically, again, and is part of, uh, of uh, genealogy. Um, so it, I, I, it's not... Uh, it's not as um, uh, sensual as, as the classic uh, horror, uh, body horror genre, the masculine body horror genres. Uh, yeah, what do you think? I was just thinking about that duplicity in the, in the Wax Museum films because you have the presentation as artwork there as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's not just focused on. There is always, uh, yeah, there is always an end uh, product, which is the, the aestheticized body, which probably uh, stops uh, us, uh, uh, I don't know, feeling 
turn our stomach <laughs> turning as uh, it would normally happen.